Welcome to The Edge, a podcast from The Bluntness, where we unpack real-world experiences and expertise of seasoned and successful professionals across both legal and legacy cannabis. I'm your host, Harrison Wise, founder and publisher of The Bluntness, and joining us today is Susie Placencia, co-founder and brand partner at Umo Cannabis, where she oversees brand development, social media, marketing, and sales, and probably more uh, for for the brand. Welcome, uh, Susie. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Harrison. So great to meet you. Awesome. So tell us uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, Umo and kind of what uh, what defines the, the brand. Yeah. So Umo, we're California's award winning Mexican American owned and woman led cannabis brand. Really, what sets us apart is that we're a very mission focused brand. So we're on a mission to really destigmatize the plant. You know, the Latino community um, has a heavy stigma with regard to cannabis use and cannabis culture as a whole. You know, the war on drugs was kind of founded on this word marijuana, right? It was in its Latino uh, focused. And so um, the impact of the war on drugs specifically particularly on the Latino community is something that this brand uh, addresses. So um, I believe that if you're a brand in cannabis, you have to answer to the war on drugs at some at some point in some way, you know, and to not do that, it, not only is it ignorant, um, it's a missed opportunity to reach a lot of people who are very conscious uh, cannabis consumers. So with um, with Umo, you know, I saw that rise of people just caring more about their products in the cannabis industry. I knew the time for a brand like Umo was going to happen. And I just feel so, so blessed to be on this journey with my partners over at Possible. Awesome. Do you, do you see like differences in marketing cannabis to the Latino community? And because within the Latino community, there's Mexicanos, Cubanos, Puerto Ricanos, you know, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Dominicanos, there's a lot, right? The Latino community is vast. Yeah. Uh, is there is there, a, a, you know, a, a way to market to, to those segments differently? Yeah, I think one of the ways that we're able to do that is through our strains, because we have strains that are we have, we're a very turf forward brand. So a lot of our strains are very just delicious because we don't cut out the sun. So we are uh, full spectrum. And because of that, the, the terpene expression is strong and we're able to really explore the strain naming, um, you know, to really represent different flavors, you know, also within different areas of Latino culture. So we have a crema naranja, which is part of our reserva line that just dropped. And uh, that one, you know, has a lot of touches that reminds me of a traditional orange drink that they uh, serve in the Dominican Republic. Um, so, you know, it's called Naranjado. So, and that one is creamy. It's orange filled, you know, it's delicious, but you know, it, again, it touches on different aspects of different Latino cultures. And that's something we're, we're aiming to do. You know, we can't be, you know, um, we can't be, you know, a brand that, that we can feel like, you know, is representative of everything at all times. Sure, but we sure. can certainly, you know, explore and seek to represent. And also we love, we're a very collaborative brand. We have a lot of fans that are vocal and they will send us a lot of um, ideas or just things, you know, that move them. And, you know, I love that about our fans. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the strain names you have, which uh, I compliment you for for the way you name your, your strains. But yeah, they're they're very evocative and you kind of get that. You just you get that vibe. Right. Straight yes, out the game. Yes. So one of our um, actually top selling strains is called Limonada. And so Limonada, I named it that because when I first encountered the strain, it took me back to the Santee alleys here in Los Angeles. And if you've ever been to the Santee alleys here um, in LA, um, it's basically an outdoor um, shopping mall, right? And it's a lot of clothing, fashion, but also knickknacks. You can get everything at Santee alley, right? And you can also, they also have a lot of snacks. So you, they're fruit cups with chamoy, but then there's also a series of aguas frescas. You can get, you know, the, the, the ones you know, horchata, but then limonada is something that's so crisp, so tart, and it often has chia seeds at the bottom. Mm. 
those are that's the flavor profile and the scent and aroma that I got from this strain. So because of that, you know, I named it that. And also when you smoke it, you get a lot of those flavors as well. The experience is very light. It's uh, very hazy, but very happy high. So um, there's a lot of reasons why that's our top selling strain. But that's really part of my, my, my naming strategy. I want to make sure that we are choosing uh, names that, while they are nostalgic at times, still um, describe the flavor, the aromas, and ultimately the experience that you're going to feel. I want to make sure that, you know, I, we don't confuse people. So that's, you know, something that is really important to me, um, representative of the culture, but also representative of the flower and the terpenes. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess the, 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 uh, the, uh, or following on that question, does, a, knowing your customer, I think it's brilliant and it's obviously working. Is there crossover into the more mainstream? Do they pick up on this? Does it resonate? Does the marketing and the messaging and the strains resonate with those outside of the culture? Yes, absolutely. That's something that, you know, I was conscious of when I built the brand because I'm Mexican-American and I'm, so that there's a whole aspect of the brand that is very friendly to non-Latinos as well. So the ways that I've been able to do that is with the naming strategy, I do have a levels that, you know, the names have to pass in order to, for them to actually be part of the menu. And part of that is making sure that the pronunciation isn't too difficult. Also, because I want to use the strain names as a way in to educate on Latino culture. Sure. So there's an there's a thoughtfulness there as well. Also, one thing that's really interesting to note is that when you go to a, a cantina here in LA or a regular dive bar, you're always going to see Modelo. You're always going to see Corona. So in that same way, Umo was built that way. You can go to any dispensary and find you know a Latino brand. But it doesn't have to be, you know, maracas and piñatas all the time. You know, Latinos are diverse, we're, but Mexican-Americans and Latino-Americans, you you know, we do have our own, you know, touch on things. And we're still Latino through and through. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, and and do you think that the older Latino community is, is that cannabis is resonating in, in that segment more from obviously a health and, and wellness perspective versus recreational? I have seen a lot of older Latinos gravitate towards Umo in a way that I've never seen before. And I think that because we have strain names like Limonada, we have another one called Mazapan, which is a peanut breath cross. And Mazapan is a very popular peanut candy in the Latino community. Mm -hmm. So these strains, they're very, it, it inspires curiosity with a lot of people. So people who I think before were not looking to to smoke flour, right? They were gonna just do those edibles, right? Tinctures. I'm not a I'm not a stoner. I just need help to sleep, right? I think a lot of those folks for the first time are okay with trying flour be because it's umo, and they're like, well, I know them. They're Latino owned. They're woman led. I trust this brand. So it's really special to see a lot of those customers, you know, uh, reach out to us and tell us, you know, this is the first flower that I've been able to smoke. And I, because I don't feel like I'm being, you know, the quote unquote stoner uh, that, you know, the, the stigma says that I need to be. So that's been really refreshing to see uh, a lot of older Latinos um, we've seen at events come up to us and say, hey, you know, I'm not a smoker, but I support your cannabis brand. I I don't, I've never supported cannabis, but for the first time I see it in a different light. And so a lot of these folks tend to be those older Latinos. So mm -hmm. that that's a really uh, a pride point for me uh, personally. <laughs> that's awesome. And, and, you know, Cheech and Chong, obviously, were the sort of the, 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 the face of, of the Latino community in cannabis, at least for many, many years. How, what's your take on how that's evolved to from from those days to to now? And they're they're still very active in the category, obviously. Yeah, one one thing that's been wonderful to see is Cheech Marine really um, assert himself more in like the the fine art world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's been wonderful to see 
you know, their start as, you know, leaning into the stoner, you know, uh, persona and really kind of being a, at the forefront of it, even to this day, but to be able to elevate you know, what they started into fine art, both with Cheech, you know, and Chong becoming um, such an entrepreneur. I think that they are such an example of what stoners can become, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Which is entrepreneurs, leaders yeah. in every industry. So shout out to them for, um, for being, you know, people of color. And that's something that, you know, at the end of the day, we resonate with and we remember, and I, mm -hmm. I always love to see and re and um, their brands grow because it's a moment of pride for all Latinos because like we started that, you know? So when we consider, you know, the stigma and all the negatives, you know, remember that Cheech and Chong and the impact that they had um, in pop culture and the industry. Totally, totally. I mean, it certainly perpetuated the stereotype of a stoner, which technically was not a good thing at the time, but you know, they definitely had fun with it and it is, it is great to see that evolution and and the, that the, part, imp the right? impact that it has now, right? That that yeah. that that evolution into, you know, advocates and and you know, basically helping that older generation too kind of come come into the fold here a little bit yeah. more. Oh yeah, I think the evolution is the most important part of that because mm -hmm. it's one thing if they were perpetuating a stereotype and that was actually them and they didn't do anything. But I think right. the most important part here is that there was a stereotype. And they broke it and they're continuing to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, any plans for Umo outside of California? Oof. Yes, we have uh, a lot of fans asking for us in so many different places. I mean, New York, Chicago, Arizona. I think um, at this point, we're focusing on California because we don't want to stretch you know, ourselves thin and just think of like, oh, let's go here, let's go there. We are focusing in California first, but we're really excited to explore other states very soon. I think that we um, we have really high standards when it comes to our flower. You know, we're, we're Possible's in-house brand. So we are used to that top quality. So when it comes to going to other states, because of the laws, you know, we're are not able to ship um, with up to other states, it won't be Possible flower. So mm -hmm. it's going to take a minute for us to find partners that match our values our integrity the way we work but also that match the quality that we get with through possible so if you're a operator in another state and you think that you can represent umo slide in my email or dm and um that's in a conversation that we're looking to explore but we're taking it slow because in this industry it's all about finding the right partners not the one right there <laughs> yeah, agreed. There's a, a lawyer that I'm fond of here in New York, Christina Bucala, and uh, she did a presentation recently and she has a list of seven questions that people in the industry should ask one another when they want to work together. But basically seven questions to ask before you fuck with somebody or somebody fucks with you or before you fuck with each other. And it's, it's brilliant. And it's true. You should know who you're who you're partnering with and, and really do do more than just a cursory you know, due diligence on them, really dive into very specific questions. Oh, yeah, I would love a list of those seven questions. I mean, for sure, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah. <laughs> time, right? You're saving your own time, that other person's time. So if there's Yeah, that's sounds smart to me. 100%. 100%. Um, so what would you, you know, it's, congrats on all the success on Umo. But you know, what would you say to people who um, are talking about, you know, the the, the rough climate, in the industry in California, specifically other states as well, certainly not unique to California. So what, what would you say since you, you, you know, you, every, by all appearances, you guys are, are succeeding, you're being very calculated and methodical and strategic. What would you say to those people who are either, you know, doomsday, you know, beating the doomsday drum or, you know, just are, are sour on, on the current uh, uh, climate in California? Yeah, uh, I would say I feel you. <laughs> I, I feel you on that. Uh, I definitely keep an eye on LinkedIn because there people are, are definitely more real on LinkedIn that I see, at least the professionals, right? The people who are in the trenches and, and dealing with this day to day. So I do keep an eye on, on the mood. Um, and I think that if you're, if you're struggling out there and you have a brand or a business, it's time to dig deeper and culture, community, there's a lot there. Um, so with Umo, that was a big part of how I built the brand. 
and we reached pretty fast success and people look at us like how did you do that in this climate and we're very transparent with a lot of things but we're very community oriented and representation and so we call on the people to help us become a top brand and they did that People go, we have fans that go into dispensaries and ask for Umo by name. They have our strains memorized. They go in and they basically have the buyer. They know exactly what to buy from us because we have these fans that are on a mission to make us a top brand because they want to see change in the industry. So that has been a strategy that I used, but it's also a strategy that is authentic to how I feel as a practitioner in this industry. And um, so I... As you know, an advocate for years before Umo, I built that reputation. So when Umo happened, a lot of the people following my journey knew that it came from an authentic place. Um, I also have a prior brand. I am a co-founder of Mota Glass, which is a leading brand of American-made products, um, glass products. And uh, so I building that brand first gave me a certain level of trust mm -hmm. from a community of people who wanted quality at, at an affordable price point. Um, so when Umo came next, uh, they already knew what I was about. And so building that reputation in cannabis is so key to um, serving up a community that is going to constantly ride for you. But also that re that does require a certain level of responsibility. Um, so I keep a transparency on 10, um, integrity on 10 and, and open communication. Yeah, it's a great example to to follow and something I'm really hoping that New York and I'm sure I'm sure it happens. I just think it has it's, we're such a new market that we'll we'll start to see that. But I you know, in terms of the connection with possible, again, Latinos all through the executive team, which you don't often see, especially in cultivation, you know, so I, I definitely want to see that. Like you guys are definitely like what it means to embody a diverse brand. Um, and especially one in the Latino community. So I, I definitely, as, as a New Yorker, also a Latino, I want to see that here across both brown and black communities. Um, but, you know, that from everything from supply through distribution and brands, you know, that that's a really powerful thing. So, you know, again, great, great example that you're, you're setting. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm excited to see more Latinos in this industry uh, throughout you know, the world. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't make, able to make it out to uh, Spanibus this year. Hopefully I get to go next year. Um, but that is a big example of just the, the industry coming together from all over the world. And it's so beautiful to see a lot of Latinos out there, a lot of people just, just getting together to talk business and cannabis. So um, yeah, it's, I think Latinos, we have a lot to offer. And I think that the stigma, unfortunately, sometimes holds back a lot of all stars that would kill it in the industry. And they're being held back from just not willing to take the jump from the industry that they're currently in. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it is scary to make that jump. You think, can I go back? You know, um, are they going to look at me like a forever drug dealer? And, you know, not necessarily. I think we're getting to the place right now where a lot of um, executives are still executives, whether it's cannabis or tech. <laughs> for sure. For sure. That's true. That's true. I, I myself have worked in tech and in cannabis, but that, 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 that perception does permeate people's thinking though. And, and how they view you. Cause like when I started working in cannabis, it's almost as if a lot of my tech experience was sort of wiped off the board <laughs> because now, now I doubled that. So it's like, Oh, even though I got 20 years in, in tech, you know, marketing and PR, because I started focusing on tech, uh, cannabis a little bit more like, like tech was like no longer a thing. It's, it's strange, wow. even, though we, even though we were serving both, both categories. Um, so it took a little extra marketing to kind of regain our you know awareness as a, as a tech agency. So it, it's, wow. it, it, there is some validity to that. It is. Um, when I first started in cannabis, it was like my near decade in PR and marketing didn't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, when you said that, it really hit home for me. Because I I was in the industry like no I I'm an expert in PR like I, I do this and crickets and so I think there's a certain level of um like just brand building that you have to do as a practitioner and that's what led me to create the Instagram Susie Greens and so um it, it's another persona but in a lot of ways it's my true self so my Instagram my main one is here Susie Placencia. But I have another Instagram called Susie Greens, and this is my hyper cannabis self. 
and it's a window into umo building umo and all and my other brands um but it's definitely me smoking you know doing doing more of my cannabis self and uh when i launched that channel is when i kind of started getting taken more seriously in the industry because um they want to see you you be about it <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Instagram. And, and as a marketer, how, how are you navigating the yeah. challenges of, of marketing on social platforms and, and just marketing in general, especially to a, a niche audience uh, such as the Latino community? Oh, man. Um, I love social media. I've been doing it for many years. Um, we, in cannabis, we have to be very strategic because we are this is not our we're not welcome here and <laughs> they do not like us there in, um, in, in Instagram and Facebook world, uh, Twitter, we're good now apparently, but Instagram continues to, uh, bring down our, our posts, uh, take down our accounts. Um, you know, so it's really difficult when you are running accounts for brands where awareness is what you're seeking, right? You're trying to get follows and here you are hit with these bands, hit with these, um, these obstacles to your goal. You know, <laughs> we already have right. obstacles as marketers and publicists and branding people. And here, are, here we are, we have to be on this platform and they don't want us here. So what we, what my strategy has become over the years is multiple channels if you're a brand out there i'm gonna drop drop the the gold right here you should have multiple channels for your brand that focus on different aspects that's just what the strategy is going to have to be for us so what i've done for umo we have our main umo instagram page that is private um for our community that's your people so it needed to be private and um we have a backup channel that I use strategically to catch the people who um, aren't seeing our main Instagram because we are mm -hmm. shadow. Right. We have a third Instagram channel. This is Umo Familia. This is our events channel. This is a Umo brought to life. Um, every event gets a flyer. Every flyer gets a recap of the event so that people can see what we're doing and what it was. Right. So this, this channel moves quickly. This channel we're posting daily on the feed on the story, um, and that and then we're about to launch a, a fourth channel. This is going to be Umo Apparel, focused on merch, all our apparel that people want are dying to buy right now. Um, this is all online right now. It is flying because people just love to rep Latinos and cannabis. Um, with our newfound pride for smoking. Merch is something that is on an all-time high in the industry right now. So it's really just amazing to see people buy merch from other states mm -hmm. because they want a little piece of Umo even if they can't smoke it. But um, so that's my fourth channel. And I think that that's the way you ha that it needs to be done in cannabis. Um, stop stop putting all your eggs in one basket because Instagram is going to take that basket. <laughs> unfortunately. That, that is definitely gold right there. That is marketing gold. Um what about some of the other platforms? Oh, you mentioned LinkedIn earlier. There's definitely one of the more receptive social platforms, more B2B centric than trying to get people into the dispensary to buy your buy product. But what's your is there a strategy for Umo there as well? Yeah, LinkedIn is we um, we do have a different we will share the same similar content, but the the copy will be different. And it's it's very much like a reporting on our brand. Like we're it's an update. Right. And so Instagram is a little focused on being being cool, community right. focused. LinkedIn is this is a brand update. This is what's mm -hmm. going on. All our press gets shared there. So we have a lot of retail partners watch us on on uh, LinkedIn to see what our moves are. You know, maybe they're not in tune on Instagram, but they are in tune on our LinkedIn to figure out uh, what are what are Umo's next moves. And so, and we post all our press there uh, on LinkedIn. I'm very active as well as, so my, my personal LinkedIn, feel free to follow me there at Suzy Placencia. But I post a lot of updates. Um, a lot of the press I put there, but then I always like to have a message uh, along with it um, because I am so, so active in the Latino and Latina advocacy space. So uh, when anytime we reach a, a big milestone, I'm very excited to, to shout out all the other Latinos because I feel like we, we're along the same journey in a lot of ways. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then what about traditional marketing? How, how do you reach new consumers? You know, you have your private community, different channels on Instagram, you know, the, the B2B stuff on LinkedIn. 
how do you reach sort of the mass market uh, yes. through, through, you know, what, whatever it might be, more traditional channels, I guess, for yes. the, the sake so of the So we actually um, just celebrated the launch of our partnership with LA Taco, which is a uh, news and culture website. So this is a, truly a partnership that is one of a kind, not one that I've seen in the cannabis industry. But when you say traditional marketing, it doesn't get more traditional than just straight up news. And so that's something that I'm so excited to have been able to launch uh, with Umo. Because I, I'm a journalist at heart. I'm a storyteller at heart. I have a master's degree in journalism. And I did news reporting and I was anchor for some time. So I think that I have a deep respect for storytelling, journalism, and journalists. And so this partnership with LA Taco, it covers um, some storytelling. It, it also covers a digital partnership, um, email marketing campaign, and we have a series of events that they're actually going to be throwing with us. So it's uh, as traditional as it gets with a media partnership, but we are very nuanced because they um, are very hot on, on TikTok. They get okay. TikTok. They get that world. And so together we've been able to do some content already. So we are doing the traditional sense a lot in a lot of ways, but we are put definitely putting in a social spin to it, a very community oriented spin. Um, we did an amazing event uh, just a couple of weeks ago with them to really launch this partnership. And our next one is going to be Arm 420. It is going to be of the most Latino 420 that LA is going to see because it's, it's going to be at the LA taco offices in downtown LA. They're going to have tacos, a full taqueria, our bong bar, uh, an alcohol bar. It's going to be a true party the way that Umo and LA Taco <laughs> does it. <laughs> awesome. I, I wish I could be there. Uh, I'm in New York, so a little little too far, but uh, sounds sounds amazing. <laughs> Come through for the next Umo event. If you're ever in LA, we always have stuff going on. Um, I think New York 420 is going to be interesting this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're we're open for well, we've always been open for business, but you know we're yeah. open for le legal business now. So it's uh, yeah, it is an exciting time. Uh, we're actually hosting an event the week after 420, um, uh, after MJ Unpacked, which is a big uh, retail brand conference, mm -hmm. cannabis brand conference here in New York. Um, and we're pooling together a collective of independent minority and women-owned media and event media publishers and event producers. To host an event called the Media Mixtape uh, on uh, April tw April twenty seventh in New York, for a lot of the reasons you just outlined, Le legal. It's it's on and it's popping. It's time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My bongs are, are Mota Glass is making um, making its way to New York. Um, uh, we are in a lot of uh, cannabis lounges out in the Chicago area, um, but it we're seeing more. Uh, reach uh, more more come out in New York so we're seeing we're seeing bigger orders drop in New York so I think that a lot of lounges um, are going to start seeing some with the glass so a little piece of LA coming New York soon nice nice and yeah I, I don't know I'm sure you've seen too the Zenko like the 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 vape sip cups type yeah I don't even know how to explain it but you know it's it's meant to be inhaled but they put it in a cup you could take it to go I mean it's it's awesome wow oh it's we awesome. love cannabis tech I, I actually <laughs> just the other day I smoked um a device that uses a laser to uh to burn the weed to, to heat up the yeah, yes. that's interesting and so I used the laser on my bong as an attachment so Shout out to Cannabis Tech, always pushing the limits of what how we can smoke. <laughs> exactly. Man. You know, it opens up your mind so you can imagine all types of solutions to problems that whether they're real or don't exist, there's there's a solution to it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so what's next for Humo? You're, you just celebrated a one-year anniversary. Um, you have a new line of small blatch flour. Tell us a little bit about that and then tell us sort of yes. what's next for Umo. Edibles, beverages, anything like that? Ooh. So first, Reserva. So Reserva de la Familia just dropped. Uh, it's a line of exclusive uh, premium genetics. This is really focusing on our relationship with breeders. So Possible has relationships with some of the top breeders in the industry. And um, really what I've been able to learn through this process is really the impact of breeders in cannabis. I don't know if they get enough of a highlight because in, in really if circles. it wasn't for... Yeah. Right. If it wasn't for their thirst of for experimentation, right? They're just they're they're just sitting there like, let's cross it and figure out what happens. 
And then some of the most legendary strains that we get the privilege of smoking come out of that. So shout out to breeders um, in general. Um, Purple City Genetics is uh, um, their breeders that we work with for the Deceva line, Conception Nurseries as well. Um, but for this line, they gave us some premium, premium genetics. And the thing with our R&D process over at Possible is when we get some genetics, they get they run through a series of tests. So we they test for potency, um, terpene expression, the look, the, the, the smell, and also if it's able to reach scalability. Sometimes we'll get a cultivar that is stellar. We love this strain, but it cannot go to scale. So then it's not able to be an Umo. And so that happened a few times. We started thinking, okay, if, it's, if it can't be grown in scale, well, let's bring this to market. Let's figure out a way to bring really special small batch, batch flour. And so uh, when I did some research, um, you know, Jose Cuervo, right? Yeah, the the awesome. legendary drinks. They have a line um, of black label. Basically, the story goes that in their te tequila area, they had a small batch of tequila that was only meant for their family. And in 1995, they decided to bring that small batch of tequila to the masses. And so they launched this special line. I was really inspired by that. And so with Umo, you know, all that small batch flour that wasn't able to make it to scale, we would end up keeping it and we would smoke it ourselves. Right, right. <laughs> so really the Reserva de la Familia line is us bringing our special small batch flour that cannot be in scale to you. So uh, we have two strains that we launched with this new line, uh, Neverita, which is a uh, really frosty strain. That's why I called it Neverita. In Spanish, Neverita means uh, a small ice box, a small refrigerator, basically. And when you look at this strain, uh, go, to, go to our Instagram at get.umo to learn more about it. But the um, it's very frosty. It's trichomed out. When I first saw the strain, I'm like, that looks like it was in the freezer. So I nice. called it Little Freezer. <laughs> nice. So um, check out um, on Instagram to see all our the full description on that. The second strain we launched with is called Crema Naranja, which is in, translated to mean orange cream. Um, that is a blue dream cross. So it has that sativa um, kind of punchy feel to it. Um, personally, it is um, one of my favorite strains right now. Um, it's great for the wake and bake, but it doesn't um, it doesn't give you anxiety. It also has a really smooth finish. I've had great naps with it. <laughs> so uh, Crema Naranja, um, check that out because it's small batch, both a Neverita and the Crema Naranja. Once they're gone, they're gonna be gone. So I, I really want you guys to experience it before it's gone. But this strain, um, these two strains, they really are different in the sense that their genetics really sing here. So we wanna put put the breeders out there with uh, with this uh, you know, with this collaboration. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see more strains from this line, but Reserva de la Familia is something I'm really excited about. Um, we have something, a lot of really great stuff coming for Umo. Little joints coming, infused, more info coming there, and also a really awesome ready-to-roll package. Um, okay. This is flour that is already grinded up with uh, joints, so you can just grab it, take it to a park, and have a nice little park sesh if it's, if it's legal there, of course. Um, but that is a, a skew that we're really excited to have in the market um, because it's our premium flour, but it's just easier. You don't have to worry about grinding it. Um, our That's merch cool. It's like, it's like, pre, like pre-prepared meals, right? They give you the carrots, the beef, the rice. And you just, all you got to do is put it together. So I, I like that idea. That's, yeah, that's cool. I love it too because it's really meant for those smokers that are, are going to smoke it right away. And there are some some people who buy the flour and then, oh, I'm going to store it, you know. And there are some people who are like, I'm buying it and I'm smoking it right now. <laughs> so that's for you right there. The ready to roll is going to hit um, the market very soon. Um, but we just have so much coming for Umo. Um, just keep the best way to keep an eye is to follow us on Instagram and really just uh, stay, stay close to the pulse of Umo. <laughs> awesome. Well, Susie, thank you for joining us today on The Edge. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, really a great, uh, a great success with Humo, uh, you know, wish you well.